All right, so I'll repeat that again for the recording. Um, I'm, I guess I'll introduce myself. I'm Mark Bowers. I'm the DevOps lead for Chameleon. And uh, before I pass it off to Kate to introduce Chameleon a bit, if you've never used Chameleon and you want to try things out, uh, you can go to this URL. It'll ask you to make an account. And you can do that by just clicking sign in with your institution uh, credentials here. Uh, or if you have a Google or ORCID, that works as well if your institution is not a part of this group. Um, and then you'll see the screen to request to join the tutorials project. Uh, click confirm and I'll get those requests. Camera. Camera doesn't see that part. I'll, I'll move that over to the center. Okay. So now they can all see you very well. Um, okay. And that's where I'll stop this for now. Um, and I'll monitor those requests. And I'm going to pass it off to Kate uh, to introduce everything. Yes. I want to share this. And I think I was right. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Um, yes. My name is Kate Kehi. Uh, Mark already introduced uh, himself with both from the Chameleon project and the Chameleon PI. Mark is the Chameleon DevOps lead. So, um, what we'd like to do in this hackathon is introduce everybody to Chameleon, first of all explain a little bit the role that infrastructure or, or very importantly open infrastructure can play in supporting practical reproducibility and then um, uh, you know I, I'll, I'll sort of explain I will like dry talk and explain um, how we're thinking about it and what services we're providing to promote it and some of those services are related to community on some of them uh, are open to other test beds as well. And then Mark will go over and show you uh, what it looks, what all of this looks like in practice. So you, in, in fact, will be hearing about the same material twice, once the theory behind it, and then the second time, how to actually do it yourself. Um, and then Mark will also demonstrate uh, an experiment um, that you could reproduce from Kimonyan, a very, very simple one. Um, I, I believe it's the power management one that you were going to do. Yes. Um, and then um, so we've got a, a list of experiments that you could reproduce, including an experiment uh, from that was uh, from a paper that was presented at this conference. So you could reproduce that experiment, um, as well as uh, some suggestions on experiments that you may want to package. So for the rest of the hackathon, you'll be applying this knowledge from uh, Mark's presentation and mine uh, in either producing or, or packaging uh, new experiments. And then, of course, we'd love if you could uh, talk to us and, and, and uh, make suggestions and ask questions um, and tell us where those things uh, work for you and where they don't. OK, so um, to, to dive into a little bit of background to Chameleon, for those of you who already are familiar with Chameleon, you can skip. Uh, we've got a new attendee here. Uh, yeah, sorry. Mark was going over how to create Chameleon accounts or how to log into Chameleon. Have you, have you done that before? No. If you could join the Zoom, I can send it in chat as well. OK. okay. <clears throat> um, so um, a, a quick overview of Chameleon. It's a, an experimental test bed for computer science. So actually, before I jump into Chameleon, I, I just want to say a few words about what the practical reproducibility in my title is, right? So uh, what we're trying to do is make reproducibility much more a mainstream, everyday kind of activity than it is right now. Right now, reproducibility in, in computer science uh, research anyways is mostly confined, not, not entirely, but, but generally confined to various uh, artifact evaluation initiatives uh, when people are trying to uh, make experiments available, reproduce them, uh, but it's not, it's not used in the mainstream. It's not used by um, 
uh, individual investigators when they are entering a new area. Um, they, it's still you know, the coin of the realm is to read papers. Uh, and so we would like to change that modus operandi. We would like science to be much more interactive and people explore, people to explore science in, in more interactive ways. And test beds uh, or open platforms on which research are done are fundamental to it. So uh, I'll tell you a little bit about that test bed talk million. There will be an opportunity also um, uh, to talk about some other test beds that are supporting different types of computer science research. So one thing that we um, uh, emphasize in Timoleon is to cover a wide range of hardware from uh, large to small. So uh, the two uh, uh, foundational um, resources or foundational sites of Timoleon are University of Chicago TAC. Uh, in both cases, the hardware is part of a large supercomputing center. TAC is the Texas Advanced Computing Center. Um, the University of Chicago Hardware is at the ALC at the Advanced Leadership Computing Facility uh, Machine Room at, at Argonne. They are both top 10 uh, supercomputing centers and, and have a lot of experience in managing scale. Um, they're also connected by a 100G network, uh, which allows uh, people to do experiments with large flows and hopefully that will get upgraded soon to uh, something even more capable. But we also, on the other end of the spectrum, seek to support edge devices. So uh, single board computers like Raspberry Pis or NVIDIA Nanos, which are increasingly more popular today because they allow investigators to instrument their environment uh, for all sorts of reasons. Right? So um, we put those devices in the field <coughs> when they are collocated with uh, phenomena that they want to observe and measure, right? So they want to understand, for example, uh, the quality of access networks, or they want to uh, look at, at uh, wildlife patterns um, or, or uh, um, intelligent agriculture and things like that. So the hardware is also very diverse. We've got multiple types of FPGAs, uh, many different types of accelerators. Uh, including very capable ones, but also uh, gaming um, uh, GPUs like RTXs. Uh, we've got a range of different storage memory infrastructure uh, from consumer grade to uh, enterprise grade uh, NVMEs, SSDs, all sorts of different types that you can compare and con contrast the performance of. We've got NVDIMs, uh, interesting networking hardware, and so on and so forth. And we also packaged the Chameleon infrastructure um, to make it easy to install. It's called, the packaging is called China Box. And it's not just packaging of the system, but it also packages the um, operations model. And that made it easy for multiple different sites to uh, join Chameleon. So Chameleon right now has a site at the uh, Illinois Institute of Technology at NCAR, which is another supercomputing center. So NCAR donated. Um, uh, some very interesting um, Thunder nodes that they were using to test their future supercomputer. We've got sites at Northwestern and UIC as well, and are working with multiple other institutions to uh, configure uh, Chameleon volunteer sites. And that, of course, gives the system not only more computing, but and more interest in computing, but it also gives us a, a higher degree of distribution. Right? So if you want to uh, run very distributed experiments, uh, that's a much better platform. So <clears throat> uh, a lot of interesting hardware, distributed hardware, very diverse, uh, all sorts of things. Um, the second thing to know about Chameleon is that offers humans like to change, right? So the name of our system is, it derives from the fact that we try to adapt ourselves to whatever configuration you need for your experimental needs, right? And for that, we support their method in configurability. So, um, by far, most of Chameleon, most of the system is configured to support uh, bare metal reconfiguration. Uh, so you could change the uh, firmware, you can power the system nodes on and off, reboot them, boot from custom kernel, uh, and all sorts of things like that. And the, the reason for support for bare metal reconfigurability is that many computer science experiments need that. Right, so people who exper experiment with performance variability, especially with hardware variability, um, need that. Power management is another type of experiments that uh, 
you know, it's a, it's a branch of science that is uh, very, very popular today, it's obviously very important. <clears throat> also, it's something that requires experimental configuration. Uh, but not everybody does. So for folks who don't do that, and, and generally speaking, those are educational projects, we also support a KVM cloud. So it's a small uh, part of Chameleon resources has been uh, virtualized and supports a, a virtualized cloud. And for edge computing, I said we can add edge devices to Chameleon and, and work with them. Uh, we support the configuration via containers. So there are different types of reconfiguration that we support for different types of hardware and in different situations. Um, and it, all of that means that you have a broader range of experiments that you can run and, and reproduce. And last but not least, uh, Chameleon is um, slightly unusual in the sense in, 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 that it was based on mainstream infrastructure. So typically, test beds for computer science research uh, were configured using uh, something developed in-house because it's it's really a venture that goes on and on, right? The, uh, the test bed is assigned to the instrument, which means that it has to adapt and change as people find new research questions to answer. And um, uh, for that, people always felt that they needed to develop something customized. Uh, we took a different approach. We said, well, most of the functionality that we want to provide is really provided by OpenStack with bare metal reconfigurability. So we just need to add some of our own special sauce. And, and we figure it's about 50% of the system is that special sauce. Uh, uh, science needs. And that special sauce uh, includes uh, special network features, snapshotting, uh, integration with Jupyter, um, which I'll talk about uh, some later on, and, and generally speaking, special features for experimentation. So in addition to all this, we have a service called Trovi that I'll talk about uh, a little bit more in a bit. And we also support um, uh, Chameleon Datas, which is something that allows you, as the owner of an experiment, the author of an experiment, to give access to the test bed to others, right? So uh, Chameleon is available for research. Anybody who wants to do research uh, can use the system. And there are various policy loopholes that sometimes make it a little bit difficult to get access, for example, if you're coming from industry. Right? So we emphasize participation from uh, academia and, and places like that. So um, this can be a little bit, create a little bit of friction uh, if you're trying to get access. So you can just go to author and the author can give you access from a special reproducibility allocation under the Northern Day Pass. Um, and all of this, so this, this means that absolutely anyone in the world could reproduce your experiment. Right, it is it is in your purview to give them access to reproduce your experiment. And like I already mentioned, uh, uh, we've got all packaged so that uh, if you want to have a site, you can have a site. And this actually proved to be uh, a reasonably important feature because in HPC and in other communities that do research on architecture, um, it's sometimes very difficult to get access to hardware to very unique hardware. So if you have the system packaged, you can add such hardware easily for a limited period of time. Um, and that makes it available to, again, anyone in the world for reproducibility. So if you need to need hardware to reproduce things, uh, we, we try to make it possible for you to, to get it. Um, a few numbers about Chameleon. Um, we, were, uh, we went online in July of 2015, so uh, almost eight years now. In those eight years, we uh, had the privilege to serve over 8,000 users uh, coming from many countries and many institutions. We got almost almost 1,000 projects. I think uh, we're like 13 projects shy of, of uh, 1,000 unique projects. Now, uh, in Chameleon, many users, they um, submit a project, a research project in order to get access uh, to the resources in order to get an allocation. And then they just keep renewing that project, right? We don't count renewals in this number. We just count unique projects. And, and this um, community published more than uh, 600 papers that we know about. I that we were able to find uh, our users, like I said, we used Chameleon for this paper. And um, you know, we went through the attestation cycle, or we found it from other sources where they explicitly um, cited Chameleon. So this is this number is a lower bound. 
I'm sure there's more figures uh, that you probably are out there, but those were those are the ones that we were able to find. Um, a quick overview of Chameleon hardware. Like I said, we've got two sites, one at the University of Chicago, the, the other one at TAC. At the University of Chicago, we also have um, the capability to add cheered edge devices. And we've got some cheered edge devices that are available in our um, IoT lab. But what our users prefer to do is they generally want to add their own edge devices uh, that are connected to some camera watching wildlife or, or some other sensors. And, and then run exp edge to cloud experiments on that added edge device, right? So uh, maybe they use our GPU resources for training, uh, some inference models that they later on run on, on the, uh, their edge device. So we support that functionality as well. But if you're just interested in uh, experimenting with the edge devices, we've got a bunch of Raspberry Pis and, and Nanos that you could um, uh, start using right away without, without needing to have your own. Um, and like I said, the sites are connected by a, a 100G network. We've got uh, some volunteer sites that I already talked about. And you see there is a Purdue logo, which is grayed out right now. Purdue was added on an ephemeral basis uh, to Kamalini last year, specifically to support EDSCC, which is a, a very prestigious supercomputing competition. This year, we are running this competition again. Um, and they are adding a, a supercomputer um, at Colorado. So um, it's possible to add resources to Chameleon for experimentation or reproducibility purposes for a short amount of time. And then, of course, we partner with, uh, with other test beds. So there's a test bed called Fabric for networking research. They, they allow you to reconfigure your network at the core, which is a, a new capability. Um, there is uh, another an NSF project called CloudBank, which provides access to commercial clouds. Um, so you can uh, run experiments across million and commercial clouds if that's what you want to do. This one of those experiments is packaged on Toby, um, actually. Um, and there's also um, there are also wireless test beds um, under the umbrella of our PAWR uh, initiative. So there are four such test beds. And they provide capabilities for um, uh, wireless uh, experimentation. And we partner with all of those test beds and as much as possible encourage and support our users in running cross platforms, uh, cross platform experiments. So, what does the experimental workflow look like in Chameleon? Um, most of the time, our users start uh, by discovering resources. So, they have some hypothesis. Uh, you know, if your hypothesis is machine learning, you probably need some GPUs to allocate. So, you can go to our portal, uh, look at the resources. Uh, Mark will demonstrate that later on. You can decide which resources you want to find and which will be uh, the most suitable ones for your experiment. We version uh, the test bed. Um, in other words, every time we have more resources, we create a new Chameleon version. And that's again for reproducibility, because if the resources change or get upgraded in some way, uh, that might uh, make a difference in the results as people try to um, replicate them. Um, you can allocate those resources uh, on demand. Uh, you can also allocate them via advanced reservations, right? So especially if you want GPUs, if you come to Camellia, it's very unlikely, especially for the sort of higher end GPUs, that um, they will be available on demand. Uh, maybe RTXs might be available on demand. Uh, but you can always make an advanced reservation. So you can see when people stop using that uh, coveted A100 GPU, uh, and you can make a reservation for that sometime in the future. Or if you have a demo or a paper deadline and you know you're going to be using resources at a certain time, you can make an advance reservation. And so long as that reservation is accepted, uh, that resource is yours for that period of time. Right? So there's no uncertainty there. Um, you can make reservations uh, in this way, not just for the nodes, but also for networks. So you can reserve VLANs. There are some, um, we call them stitchable VLANs, which um, uh, uh, for, for network stitching, for creating network slices. And you can reserve also public IPs. Right? So public IPs in uh, IPv4 space are a very scarce resource. And again, if you need a demo, or if you're going to be running um, a service on Camellion and you need to give somebody that IP address ahead of time, it's a useful feature to use. 
um, we treat resources as non-fungible entities. And what does that mean? Uh, that means that if you want to say something generic, like I want an Iceland node, or I want an ARM node, we will find you and, and we will match you to Iceland node and ARM node. But we do also recognize that no two Iceland nodes are the same. Uh, you know, they can have different properties. And especially, again, if you're experimenting with systems uh, and uh, with, with low level properties with uh, power management and performance variability, uh, it might make a difference to you if you're using this isolate or that isolate, right? So we do have actually users who want to use a special node uh, to keep to the same performance baseline uh, that is specific to, to a node, right? So we just treat the hardware as non-fungible. So again, you can reserve a specific node or you can reserve by node type and then we'll pick one node for you. We will we'll optimize operations. Um, for configuration, uh, I already said we support mainly bare metal, most of the monion is available by a bare metal configuration, but we also have KVM cloud and for the image. <laughs> we have an image catalog. So uh, every month we publish a tips and tricks blog that highlights certain features of the system. This month's tips and tricks blog is about images and, and the images we support and why do we support them and, and what to expect and things like that. So read the blog if you want to uh, understand more, but there's a wide range of images that we support for different uh, hardware capabilities. Um, we support snapshotting, which means you can save your image. So if you deploy your image, you put some extra configuration on it, and then you want to save it, uh, that's what snapshotting is. Um, if you want to orchestrate your experiment, in other words, uh, do some work up front and then deploy it all with one click, right? Uh, we support something called Heat that allows you to do that via an orchestration template. And so you say, I want these five nodes, and this is how they're going to be connected. And you know, when they wake up, this is what should be run on it, and, and things like that. Um, so uh, heat orchestration will do it for you. But orchestration is declarative, and I'll talk about that uh, a little bit more. These days, um, and you know, for some time, our users have been preferring um, to use Camoleon via, via programmatic, imperative programmatic interface in Python or in Bash. Um, and uh, they also like Jupyter Notebooks. So what we did is we integrated Jupyter with Camoleon and you can use um, uh, Camellium by a programmatic, programmatic interface through Jupyter Notebooks. And then uh, Mark will demonstrate uh, and, and show you exactly what this looks like. And we also support uh, network stitching and, and bring your own controller uh, functionality. Now, all, this, uh, all these interfaces here that I outlined uh, that you do, that you use at various stages in, in constructing your experiments are available via graphical user interface, of course, via the GUI, via command line interface, and via Python, right? So command line interface and Python are both programmatic interfaces uh, that support reproducibility because, of course, if you use the GUI, you don't know, remember what you clicked on uh, uh, versus when you've written a program or a script, somebody else can rerun that. And there is a, there is a paper that we have that uh, that describes all of those features in more detail and what the update was in Camellia. And this is just uh, a quick reminder, the test that is not just a test, but, but it's a community of researchers. There's a lot of people behind that test, but we're using that test bed for a variety of experiments. So we collected uh, a bunch of pictures of our users over the years, and they are you know, presenting at conferences, showing demos, uh, participating in competitions, they are working in their labs on, on a variety of different projects, including uh, a pair of RU students receiving an award at Supercomputing uh, 2017. So if you want to understand more about what our users do, there are two avenues to do that. One is we have a blog, um, and at the bottom there, there's a link to, in, in that blog, we have a category for users, user experiments, so every month, we do a virtual interview with one of our users, uh, either on education or uh, on, on research stories. Um, and they tell us about their research and how they use Camellion. They have pointers to their papers and sometimes to the Jupyter notebooks that they use on Camellion that you can 
have seen some ideas from. So those are very popular. Uh, uh, those are very popular very popular content on our board, probably the most popular stories. And the other way to find out what the users do on Canonian is, of course, to uh, go to our web page and in the about tab, uh, you can look at the research done in Canonian, and that's where the 613 papers are uh, you know, yeah. we updated annually, generally speaking. So, um, okay, so so much by way of introduction to Canonian and now switching gears a little bit. Uh, let's talk about uh, reproducibility. So what we realized at some point that having an open platform like Camilla that is available to all who want to do research um, creates an opportunity because that means that uh, it, it takes out a barrier to reproducibility. Right? If, you, uh, if you had an experiment and you just showed the code that went into uh, creating that experiment, that doesn't mean that it will be easy for somebody to rerun it because the hardware on which to rerun it is, is a critical ingredient. <clears throat> and very often it's much more critical for computer science than other sciences because for computer science, it might require a, a very special unique architecture or a very special unique networking configuration that is hard to uh, obtain in places. So this idea that you have an open platform uh, means that all of a sudden that obstacle to reproducibility is gone and, and anybody can do it, right? So again, um, you can rerun experiments very easily. And what is the opportunity here? Well, one opportunity, of course, is that you're reading a paper and you see an interesting looking experiment of power management is in this paper uh, specifically, right? And you click on that experiment or, or you, you tap on that uh, graph and you say, oh gosh, I, you know, this is a very interesting graph. I wonder, you know, what was the worst case instead of average case? Or, you know, I can I see the data? Like Thorsten was saying at the, in his keynote, right? Don't don't show me the uh, analytics, just show me the data. And you want to go back to the source, well, you can tap on it, you can go back to data and code that is available on an open platform, and you can redo the analytics. And you can also redo the experiment itself. And you can even do the experimental setup, right? So you have various grades of, of reproducing the experiments that, that are suddenly available to you. And we could go even further than that. So, you know, when I start a new area of research these days, I go to the AC Digital Library and I say, you know, let's see who did research on edge computing. And I read some papers and I understand what people did on edge computing or reproducibility or things like that. But I could go to another hub, a different hub, and instead of looking at papers, I could look at results. I could look at experiments that people have run. And I could download those experiments and I could run them myself and I could reproduce them, but I could also vary them a little bit. I could say, oh, this is a great idea, but let's see how it does in this other hardware. Why didn't it run it in this other hardware? I'm gonna, I'm gonna try that. Or I'm going to, to, to run something slightly different. I came up with a new algorithm. I'm going to drop it right beside their algorithm and compare it side by side. Let's see what happens. Or they have a great model. Let's see how it does on my data set, right? Not their data set. Or I could go to the analytics and we do the analytics and play with data differently. So all of a sudden I can I can really interact, I can really debate. Uh, and, and engage with the authors of that experiment much more effectively than if I'm just reading and second guessing what they must have done that generated all those great graphs. And furthermore, I could not only do that, but I could, I could use that for teaching, right? So it's, uh, teaching is much easier, much more fun, I think, if you get to explore things in practice and in practical. So uh, there are all these applications of, of reproducibility and infrastructure availability is, is really fundamental to that, right? Because that really, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I just have a question whether you, I, I love this idea in general. Mm -hmm. Are you suggesting that from the paper, you'll be able to click on a graph and, and get to all these things, or there would be another sort of repository that for results? That'll well, I'm that. suggesting both, but the, from the paper, this paper that you see in there, it actually has that click in it. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so this this is what uh, what Mark's going to be showing, and that might I don't know if you have the PDF of that. This is a this is a, a kind of a dummy paper that we created for a relatively simple 
power management experiment that would have been done maybe 30 years ago or something like that. Maybe we should go and, and dig for a specific paper and make it a little bit more realistic. But the, the PDF that we created for this, you can actually click through. So that's one thing. But the other thing is, yes, I am suggesting that it will be a hub where you come and you just have experiments that are linked to papers, right? Uh, and, and you can read the papers with the experiments as you explore the experiments. But in a sense, this makes the experiment a personal citizen, right? Because right now we go to ACM Digital Library, right? We find the papers and then we try to find some artifacts and things like that. And you know, maybe that happens, maybe that doesn't, right? Whereas what we could do is invert this process start playing with experiments and say, geez, this is a really exciting experiment. Let's see what the author had to say about it, mm -hmm. right? Um, so in this conference and in many conferences on reproducibility, what we hear is that paper is an advertisement for an experiment, right? What does that mean? That means that maybe we can skip the advertising. <laughs> we can go to the actual experiment and then look at the advertisement a little bit too, right? Because people have interesting insights. But that, yes, you know, I'm, I'm saying maybe we've done enough advertising, right? Let's let's um, uh, go down to this. Okay, so this idea that open platforms are critical for reproducibility because they significantly uh, reduce friction for reproducibility um, is something that I tried to develop in a in a uh, in an editorial I wrote some time ago, but essentially. What I was saying there is that we're halfway there. Without having done anything, we're essentially halfway there. Because number one, if we do have open platforms, right, then that means that um, you have the same access to hardware as, as I do. So in other words, if I do this wonderful, amazing thing uh, and, and you know evaluate it on a cluster of, of GPU nodes that I have in my department, so you can't reproduce it because you don't have access to the uh, to the uh, cluster of GPUs in my department. Well, now that's not the case anymore, right? We can we both have access to a cluster of GPU nodes, including access to the same ones, right? So again, if we do any of that low level stuff, performance variability, and things like that, we can compare head to head. We can compare things exactly. So this non fungible resources very important. Um, and then open and version control also important. The other point is that if you use clouds as opposed to uh, your laptop or, or any other uh, uh, sort of uh, resources that somebody may be configured for you or, or that you configured yourself um, uh, in the hardware, uh, you are forced to formalize part of your experiment already because you're forced to create an image to deploy on the cloud. That's just how clouds work, right? Nobody is nobody is making that up, right? This is this is now very different than if you experiment in a lab uh, on a machine that was perhaps created by a, uh, where the configuration was created by a system administrator, and perhaps you don't even know completely what's in that configuration, right? Because you don't necessarily know how it was created, right? So you're working with an image with a configuration that you created yourself, and furthermore. That creation, um, that, that image is snapshotted and it represents, or you know, or perhaps you have scripts on how that image gets created. But that that snapshotting, the image plus the scripts, they represent a, a, a method for creating uh, your experimental environment, right? So they already capture the experiment done. And here's the interesting thing. Over the last eight years, there are thousands of users created thousands of such images and orchestration templates and Jupyter notebooks. So they created all those artifacts and they are there. Most of them are actually publicly available. But even though it means that they, they take you halfway towards being able to produce an experiment, you won't find out about them. They are not connected to experiments. So there's a, there's like a treasure trove, right? Uh, it's just not connected, not advertised, not articulated. This is something that you could use for uh, repeating that, that experiment. So what do we need to now uh, find that pot of gold, right? To, to get at the treasure that we already have, 
the, the, the damage side effect of, of people using crowds for experimentation. So I, I sort of looked at the needs of people who reproduce experiments and package experiments. So I said at the, at the end of this, as part of the hackathon, we're gonna do both. And we would really welcome your thoughts on you know, what, what those considerations really are. But when you're reproducing somebody else, somebody else's experiment, what do you need? Well, from the perspective of packaging is first of all, you would like to get a complete packaging of experiment. So all the code, all the data, all the description of how the experimental compilation was created, maybe some orchestration template, or uh, you know, all the data analytics, all the everything, right? All the artifacts. Secondly, I already alluded there was a difference between a, a declarative um, a formulation of an experiment and imperative formulation. What well, declarative formulation means, I describe my experiment in terms of a state that I want to achieve for that experiment. So, for example, I say a virtual cluster of eight nodes that are configured in such and such way and interconnected uh, in, in a certain way, right? And the system goes out and creates that for me. And many people find that very compelling because um, uh, logically that means that that creates that lowers the barrier to creating that experiment because makes it easier, makes it conceptually easier. Unfortunately, if you describe things in a declarative way, that description may not be uh, very exact, right? So there may be many configurations that fit into what you describe. That's bad for reproducibility because if somebody who creates the configuration for some reason ends up with some slightly different uh, that's you know that, that might not be reproducible um, also in the process of creating that configuration you might have some side effects you might uh, your your process might create some side effects that might also then impact your reproducibility but the biggest problem with the declarative uh, way of representing your experiments is the fact that they are transactional so in other words, um, from here and to where you get to the state you describe, it's one closed transaction. It's supposed to be one closed transaction, right? Because it's supposed to be encapsulated and easy to use, right? So not just a black box, but a shrink black, black box. And this is a problem because experiments have different stages. You create a, an experimental container, you run the body of the experiment, you run data analytics. Uh, and so forth. At each of those stages, you might have a new idea. You might say, I, I'd like to do something else. They created a cluster of eight nodes. Um, I'd rather create a cluster of 512 nodes and see how that happens. You know, they ran on Icelex. What if we go back a few generations of uh, Intel and we run this in Haskell? So what happens then? Right? What if we run it on some different architecture altogether? If this is all encapsulated as a shrink wrap black box, you can't do that, right? All those uh, opportunities to vary the experiment, to interact with science, are lost. So imperative, when you write the program on how to create that experiment, right? So create this cluster of 512 nodes by allocating the nodes, recombining the nodes, creating uh, network connections, and so forth offers you many more, I mean, it's, it's, it's uh, one, it's a much narrower road, so it's much uh, less possibility of uncontrolled variation, but also much more possibility for controlled variation, right? So if you get the brilliant idea on how do things a little bit differently, you can do that. Um, so imperative, non-transactional, right? We don't want it encapsulated. We want to be in a situation where we want to rerun it bits by bits and there are good stocking points where you could go off in another direction. Or if something breaks, you could fix it easily, right? Because it's just a small thing that broke, right? Rather than the whole big thing broke and we don't know what to do with it. And they should be integrated. So I just said, we've got those thousands of digital artifacts that are not connected to experiments and they are not connected to papers. Um, they should be connected, right? That's what I mean by, by integrated. And it turns out that that integration idea has been around for a while. And of course, who else but Donald Knuth came up with it, right? And it's called literal programming. So the idea that you combine code um, uh, or, or, or scientific process expressed in an interface in code with explanations, with data analytics, with illustrations, and so forth. 
And today, the uh, most popular implementation of virtual programming is Jupyter. And I will talk about that uh, a bit later. So secondly, the person who's reproducing this experiment, they need access to this experiment, and they need access to, for reproducibility to both the, the code and all the experimental artifacts and the infrastructure on which it is run. And so they then also need to discover and find experiments uh, along the way you just talked, right? So not just from the paper, but also it would be cool to have a hub where I can go and I can say, you know, who experimented here with uh, with Edge, because I would like to uh, look at that. So through various channels, not just through the papers. Now, from the person perspective of the person who packages experiments, things are a little bit different. So especially in the packaging uh, realm, because the author, generally speaking, in, in my experience at least, wants a way of packaging an experiment that is cost effective, right? So in other words, there's this dilemma, do I put time in, in reproducing an experiment or, or making my experiment reproducible, or do I put time into new research? And making an experiment reproducible steals time away from your research. So there is that tension always. So in as much as we can make it a side effect of research or do something that users already do, um, uh, that's best. And we are already doing that because uh, we're using the cloud platform, so people have to create images anyways to use cloud, right? We're already leveraging that up. That happens as a side effect. Uh, your environment gets packaged, right? So maybe we can also uh, leverage up and all other things. But they also want a way of packaging an experiment that is user-friendly um, because they want impact of that experiment, right? So the user-friendly brings them more in alignment with the person who is ultimately reproducing the experiment, so creates a bridge. So it's it's very important to preserve those author to, um, uh, to uh, uh, audience incentive. So uh, give access for reproducibility, right? Again, we're after impact, we want impact, so we want people to reproduce our experiment, uh, uh, so that's great. And then we want to share work in progress um, uh, with collaborators, but we also want to share completed work. We want to say, this is not side this is side of the experiment, right? And very important, get credit in some way for having packaged the experiment for, for making it a contribution. So I'm going to talk with got with, with services that uh, are team developed in all three aspects of this, and I'm going to talk about them one by one, and then Mark will show you what it looks like in practice. So first of all, packaging shareable experiments. Um, uh, we already talked literate programming. Jupyter is a great implementation of that literate programming, and our users wanted to use Jupyter already. So what we did is we integrated, uh, uh, we provided a Jupyter interface to Camellia, right? We integrated a Jupyter hub with Camellia such that uh, you, uh, when you log into Jupyter hub, you, you log into the testbed at the same time, and your authentication, your credentials are implicit in all the Jupyter cells. This has two important, I mean, has many consequences. Mm -hmm. has many consequences. Mm -hmm. Number one, it just makes it easier, right? You, you're logged into the testbed. But number two, that also means that nowhere in that Jupyter notebook are you storing your credentials and, and having to take them out uh, ultimately. So that Jupyter notebook is ready to share, right? You don't have to fiddle over any credentials. Number one, usability, very important. Uh, number two, ready to share, it's not in the, um, in the notebook. So, <clears throat> and then of course, in Jupyter, we have uh, a Python kernel, which we already have a Python to, uh, interface to the testbed and a bash kernel. You can use those programmatic imperative kernels, non-transactional, uh, as an interface to the, te uh, to the uh, testbed. So this Jupyter notebook now acts as a glue between the various experiment artifacts that you have. So those images, those thousands of abandoned publicly available images that were not connected to a result are now connected to a result. They're connected to the rest of the experiment. Right, because in your Jupyter notebook, you say which image you deploy, right? That capture, it captures that code. Um, and then um, you can uh, create what we call experiment patterns, which are essentially an experimental container 
that many people use. So in the power uh, management uh, experiment that, Paul, that Mark is going to be demonstrating, you know, somebody else could take the uh, container creation, the experimental environment creation part of that Jupyter notebook, just cut and paste, create your own experiment, new control management, something completely different. Somebody could take just the data analysis part of that experiment, use that data analysis in a different experiment, right? Or, or, or just or replace it with your own different data analysis. You can, you can mix and match different ways. And again, we've got a paper that explains uh, a little bit more uh, behind the philosophy of, of that combination. So this packaging, it, it achieves for us very important ways. Again, it connects all the experimental artifacts uh, it lowers the barrier uh, to um, uh, to experimentation somewhat. Um, it, it, it provides a sort of as a side effect uh, uh, vehicle for our users who use Jupyter. A lot of them do, right? So uh, it's it's uh, many advantages there. So then you want those experiments to be findable, but how are they going to be findable? And this is again. Uh, this is this is an area where we feel the infrastructure can help, right? Because if you think about sharing papers, we're all equipped to read papers, right? You can all all we need is a pair of eyes to uh, read a paper. If you share digital content, it's not so easy because you need either visualization or you need a programming uh, environment to replay that, uh, that experiment, or you need something. You need the infrastructure, right? So. Sharing experiments should be, uh, you know, I, I would argue that sharing experiments should be done close to the infrastructure, especially if your experiments have a strong dependence on infrastructure, right? And the metaphor I use is that of a library, which uh, if you check out the microphone from a library, they will also give you a microphone to read, read it, because otherwise you can't really do anything with that microphone, right? So they, they need to equip you. Similarly here, if you share experimental artifacts, they need to be shared as a compute capsule, as a combination of code, data, other artifacts, and infrastructure on which those artifacts can be replayed. So we created a service called Trovi, and sometimes people refer to it as Camoli and Trovi, and we need to all fight that because this is not a Camoli service. So Trovi has open APIs that allow you to integrate any test bed, any open platform, uh, with the Trovi system. And, and we're currently working with Fabric, and we're also working with another um, NSF supported cloud called Jetstream to integrate them with Trovi so that users can run experiments or, or teaching modules or anything like that on those different platforms as well. Right? So some, some artifacts will be, you can run only on, on Fabric because they provide uh, network capabilities that we don't provide. Like no one's not going to test that. Um, you know, some artifacts will be executable only on Camellium, right? Because Camellium provides GPUs, which Fabric doesn't provide, right? They're a network test, but they're not, um, they don't support cloud computing research. But the important thing is that you can go to one hub and have artifacts that run on all those different test beds. All those test beds also support federated identity, which means that you don't have to create a special accounts for any of them. It's kind of like having a dual um, and all of those things. So Trovi has Trovi artifacts, and Trovi artifact uh, represent an experiment. Uh, so has all those uh, experiment components I was talking about. And what we're trying to do also in Trovi is add metrics, uh, because that's, again, those incentives that create a bridge between the author of an experiment and somebody who uses the experiment. Um, so metrics that tell you how many times an experiment was viewed, how many times an experiment was executed. And they're perhaps not perfect. They are, you know, first iteration of creating some sort of incentive structure, but they're there. And we've got a portal, and we, again, we expose APIs. So our portal is maybe not the most wonderful thing in the world where we're backend people and not portal people, but anybody can implement any other front end, right? So long as you have the APIs. And we also integrated with Trovi, we integrated with Swift, um, which is the uh, object store and Camellia, so you can store experiments, sort of basic storage. Um, but we also integrated with GitHub, right? So GitHub provides a lot of uh, cool features like versioning, like, like the ability to fork and manage code forks and things like that. 
that we don't want to replicate, right? So we've got an integration with GitHub that uh, uh, hopefully will improve over time. And lastly, we have an integration with Zenodo. So once you're once you feel that your experiment is ready for sharing, ready for publishing, you can publish it to Zenodo, get a DOI, then you can then reference in your paper, right? And you can say your paper, this is the DOI for the experiment. And you know, the experiment might take on a life after your paper. People might create new versions, right? But this is this is one way to look at it. Um, okay, so so much about findability and uh, last but not least. Uh, Chameleon Day Pass. So we do provide access to uh, to the test bed uh, with Day Pass. And you see this paper that I was showing um, earlier. It will take you to the page for the experiment. And on that page, you've got this request Day Pass button. And you can say, I'm going to request, uh, I'm going to ask uh, for uh, reproducing this experiment on Chameleon. I have no account on Chameleon, or maybe I don't want to use up my allocation on Chameleon. And then the author um, has the uh, has the opportunity to give you access. So uh, we've got an open platform for systems research. Just so enough of this guy talk. Uh, we're going to turn it over to Mark. Mark uh, our configuration, uh, the direct uh, range of hardware, all of those things. And the question is, how can we use it to promote responsibility for computer science in particular? Right? How can we? promote a uh, more interactive approach uh, to science. And, and uh, we sort of propose the sort of three-pronged approach or, or three-pillar approach, or however you choose to describe it, right? By a programmatic interface to the test bed, literate programming that allows you to create a link between the research and the experiment. Um, Trovi, an experiment repository that is not just a repository of experiments, codes, artifacts, but also integrates them with an infrastructure on which they can be read, which can be on, on possibly multiple infrastructures, but at least one, and Chameleon Day Pass for ephemeral access. Okay, so now we're going to we take it over to Mark. I'm going to stop sharing, and Mark will show you how all those things look in practice. Uh, yes, okay. Um, and I think as people were joining the Zoom, I was sending them my slides um, so they can follow along. So if anyone else wants to join the Zoom, I can, uh, you can then click on links, but I'll also show you how to navigate around. Um, okay. So the first thing I want to show is uh, if, if you have uh, already followed these first two slides, and I, I believe I have uh, added you to a chameleon project, meaning you now have access to all of these resources Kate was just talking about. And uh, if you go to our website, uh, chameleoncloud.org, uh, once you have that project, that allocation, um, you'll have a project here. Uh, it'll, it should be the tutorial project, but with, with that project, uh, you can get started. Um, and so the first thing I'd like to point out is we have this experiment tab and there's Trovi. And this is what Kate was just talking about. Our, this is our uh, artifact repository of where people have uh, published and shared experiments that work on Chameleon. And the first few things here we have are kind of featured ways to get started and show off different uh, parts of the test bed. So this first one, bare metal experiment pattern, I'm going to open. Uh, and it's also linked in the slides there. Uh, and here, it gives some description of what exactly this does. And it talks about the history. But in order to use it, there's this launch button. And uh, as a lot of people try to do this at once, uh, it may slow down, as this is a Kubernetes cluster. And so it's going to have to scale. but uh, it, it should get you in with a, within about a minute, I would say. Uh, once it slows down, hopefully it goes faster for me. I, I've launched this before, so uh, I expect it to look uh, the same as what you would all be seeing. Okay, and uh, this is the Jupyter uh, environment that Kate was talking about. And so this is Jupyter Hub. And what that allows us to do is give you a Jupyter Lab environment, 
but uh, we authenticate you uh, when you log in and authenticate you to the testbed resources. So the first thing I'll do is I'll open this up and uh, this experiment comes with a readme, which talks in more detail of what exactly is going on. So uh, the first few steps of the experiment, the first one is to set up, oops. Uh, the first step is to set up uh, the environment for it. So that means we're going to need a bare metal node. And this is a little small, but. So we'll grab a bare metal node and to do that on Chameleon, since we're in a shared environment, we have to reserve it first. But uh, usually there are some on-demand resources you can grab right away. Uh, and then we'll have to actually create an instance on that bare metal node and then install any software that we need for our experiment. So I'll get that started now. Um, and then this takes a bit of time since uh, we're configuring bare metal servers. So uh, here, maybe I'm going too fast through this, but I opened up the experiment uh, file that it mentions in the readme. And there is some literate uh, text here. So the first thing we have to do is create that experiment container, as I just explained. And here it also mentions, we'll give it an IP. Uh, and that'll just help us connect to it to uh, programmatically run commands. Uh, so the first thing we have to do is configure a little bit. And that means we have to add uh, what project we use. So I'm a chameleon operator. So I am a part of this chameleon project, but everybody else uh, that joined the tutorial project, if I go to my dashboard, my projects, and I have a lot of projects. So I just go down, there's this one, chameleon user meeting tutorials. So I'm just reusing this from our previous meeting, but it gives us the project name CHI231132. So I'll copy that and paste it here as my project name. <coughs> um, and it says I'm using this project. And I also, in this step, uh, told it to use the University of Chicago site. And that's located in the Argonne National Lab Data Center. Um, if I wanted to change sites, I can update that line then. Uh, the next step in this experiment is to create the reservation. So I'm actually going to tell it what node I want to use. And this is where uh, I, it explains here, there's various types of errors that might occur at the step and how to get around them. But I'll hopefully run it successfully with no problems. And it is giving me some helpful output. So it created a lease and now has to wait for the lease to start. Uh, and I think that should take under a minute here. Yeah. Uh, so I was able to find these resources and uh, now we just have to wait for them to be ready. So even though this is a lease, you know, I was able to grab these on-demand resources. While that's running, I can talk through what's going to happen in this next step. So this now, once we have the lease, we're able to actually provision uh, the node that that comes with. And if I look here, I can actually see what I reserved. So I got a node reservation and there's this <coughs> variable here for a compute cascade lake R. Uh, and I'll show a bit more about what that means, but that's uh, the type of CPU on that node. And there's also this, floating IP reservation, and uh, that worked out. Okay, so now there's this provision step that I'm gonna get running, because this takes the longest, um, and it may take around 10 minutes. And this is because we are uh, flashing our OS image here. So we have CC CentOS 8 stream. This is a. This is basically just uh, CentOS 8, but we install a few helpful uh, utilities to like access your object store data uh, and to flash your instance. But uh, and we load like your SSH keys onto this. Um, but that's what this is. It's it's basically just CentOS 8. Uh, 
so I think everybody who uh, I added to the project should be able to have run this. Has anyone had issues yet? Or I don't know if people are running it, but uh, let me check everybody uh, got the Zoom link. Let me have uh, Okay, so showing off a bit more of what is going on. Uh, I mentioned that I was getting a cascade like R node. So uh, what exactly does that mean? That's a great question. Back on the Chameleon website, under this experiment tab, right above Trovi, well, a few items above Trovi, there's a hardware discovery button, and that'll show you all the hardware. Uh, and it took a second to load as it went through all of our various sites to gather the inventories, but it shows there's 586 nodes right now uh, that you can use on Chameleon. Uh, these are broadly our node. Uh, we, this is called the node type. All these uh, words, and I we use Cascade Lake R, and it says there's 82 of those. If I click on it, I can filter and view more of what all the nodes in this category are. And I'll click on this one. So this one is C6 C0615. Uh, it says it's at TAC, and if I look at the processor, it tells me you know what exactly it is. Uh, it tells me what networking hardware is connected to this node, uh, what storage devices this has exactly, um, and what you can expect if you reserve that node. We, we have given all the nodes the node type that kind of broadly group them all together, uh, but I, I believe the hardware should be pretty consistent within all, each of these categories. Or if I don't know exactly what I want, I can go down to these advanced filters and say, well, you know, maybe I want a node that has 96 threads on the CPU. And then as I scroll down through the advanced, you know, I can filter by how much cache there is, or uh, if I have certain experiments and I'm going to want to set up my own cluster. Uh, I'm going to want to filter by nodes in the same rack. Uh, maybe you want to get GPUs. We have all the different GPU models here as well. Uh, we have nodes with FPGAs. Uh, we have nodes with high bandwidth network adapters. Uh, and if you're interested in specific storage types, uh, we have all the models listed there as well. So I can go back to my tab here, and it's still going to be waiting for the server to start, uh, which is fine. While that happens, maybe I can show you the next thing here. If I scroll up on the hardware discovery, uh, it mentions first there's calendars for each site on what exactly the availability is. So if I click this link for Qi at UC, which is the site I was using, uh, it'll open the calendar. And here I can see a row for each node of this type. So I switched it to Cascade Lake R. Um, and I see all of the different nodes. Each of these colored bars is somebody is using that node. So there's lots of availability for this node type. Yeah, and if I scroll down, I think these two must be uh, people running the bare metal experiments, as I see that they just started, or maybe that was a coincidence. Yeah, there's a few successful reservations there. Um, if I go to like one of our GPU nodes, here's uh, A100s, and they're all very busy. So as Kate mentioned, uh, sometimes you have to book ahead, especially for uh, these more in-demand nodes. But I think the RTX nodes, yeah, it looks like there's at least one that is open right now. Um, the other way to get to that is sometimes when you log in, it redirects you. Um, on the left here, there's a reservations tab. And 
leases, and then the calendar. And while I guess I am still waiting for my server to start, I'd like to also show uh, a bit more of this uh, GUI interface. Can I just ask a question? Yeah. So, and, and I'm just watching, I'm not. Okay. Um, is this a step that you would have to do every time? Or is this just so, specific to this particular experiment? Or uh, typically for pretty much any exper experiment, you would have this uh, 10 minute period while you're launching a node. Um, we do have a KVM site that, uh, that Kate mentioned, and those uh, VMs start very fast, you know, definitely under a minute, I would expect, uh, depending on the size of the image you're launching. But uh, for the bare metal nodes, uh, it will take some time. And uh, you could, you know, have a node that you already have launched and use that for an experiment. But for a reproducibility standpoint, you know, I'm, I'm coming into this experiment clean without setting anything up before. That this was just some something somebody else shared, and, yeah. and so I'll, I'll have to set up my own note for it. Um, but I, I would like to show off this user interface a bit. When you uh, go to it to start, and you can get here under experiment, and then she at UC or any of the other sites. Uh, it takes you to an overview, and this looks fairly close to a commercial cloud site that you may have seen, or if you've used OpenStack before, it should look very familiar because it is the OpenStack user interface. Um, it takes you to this overview tab, but you know I have a compute instances, and this is where VMs would be, uh, or this is where your bare metal instance shows up. So I'm going to actually switch to uh, the tutorial project we're all in, and I see we have five of these working. Uh, and it looks like uh, these are all building. See, this is my coworker, Adam. Uh, he had some error, but I think he was testing out a custom image, and so he's still working on it. I can click on my instance here. I see it has my name in it. Um, it says it's building, and it gives me all this other information. What's the private IP address? I can click on this console tab, which will connect to the serial console of the node. And this will give me some insight into the boot process, uh, which might be interesting. Usually, oh, yeah. And it looks like the root is not printing anything very interesting at the moment. So that's OK. Oh, there we go. Uh, it looks like DHCP is configuring. And this is what my, uh, we have uh, infrastructure lead on Chameleon, who is much more familiar with how this boot process works. And he tells me that the DHCP uh, process of actually getting all the networking to work on your node is what takes so long. So. We, uh, that'll finish up. Um, other things of interest here maybe is we have an object store and you can create a container and use our CLI or you're able to use uh, S3 compatible tools uh, to upload. We have uh, this share service, which is uh, an NFS. And we have some documentation on how to actually use that. Uh, and then we have this reservations tab, which shows uh, the resources you deserve. Um, I can take this time to also point out under the learn tab, we have, you know, documentation. And it takes you to the welcome. And there's a getting starting page that will kind of be similar and show off all the different things that are going on. Uh, and we have various technical pages for each uh, service we provide. So I mentioned we have uh, the object store, so that should be one of these, yeah. And then we have this uh, share system, which is the NFS service. 
I was looking around a little bit in the hardware and I saw that you have the uh, A64FX. Is that the Fugaku supercomputer? Uh, yeah, okay. The Fugaku. I work at ARM, so I just noticed. Um, the Fugaku. Uh, yeah. What was the question? Like, how, how is it that you have, like, you, that is a, oh, do we yeah. get a Fugaku node? Yeah, <laughs> well, exactly. This is, this is what I was talking about with the Cheetah Box kind of stuff. It makes it possible because because Chameleon is packaged now. It makes it possible for super you know supercomputing centers regularly get uh, hardware for just testing because they keep abreast of what everybody else is doing. So NCAR, when they added ARM nodes, said. Uh, this is, uh, you know, we, we were testing those, those standard nodes for our next green supercomputer due to pandemic delays. This is not going to happen, right? Because we can't just get enough hardware of that type. But uh, you guys have it, right? Okay. This is our testing hub. So when Don Stanzion, who is the director of TAC, saw that, said, this is a great idea. I have some Fugaku nodes left over from testing. Have it, you know? Um, and, and this is a great, this is, you know, this is a, a thing where everybody wins because uh, from the perspective of the supercomputing centers, if they spend uh, a large allocation of budget on testing hardware, that's starting to raise eyebrows, right? Because you spend so much money, all it does is testing and then you kind of, I mean, from from a large scale supercomputing center perspective, eight nodes is nothing, yeah. right? You can't really use it effectively. But if they can add it to Chameleon, that means that they amortize that expense. So since they can now amortize their testing dollars, right? They can have more testing dollars. Okay. Right? And our users are delighted. For Draco nodes, they were very popular when that put, put that first out, you know? And it looks like you're interested as well, right? So well, well I work at R. Oh, uh, okay. So, so the, the instruction set. That, okay. uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So so and I, you know, I don't know how to get access to it. So I was fascinated when I saw it here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's cool. So yeah. maybe you guys have some spare hardware that you want to make uh, available to users as well. Right. Or some we don't produce any hardware at all. We just yeah. do the blueprints. So we rely upon other companies, yeah. you know, okay. to build actual hardware. So, so yeah, I just noticed that. Sorry. Yeah, but this is definitely one of the things I think Chameleon does really well is we have a, a wide array of hardware. Uh, we, we have a great diversity in what we offer. Uh, I think this makes it very interesting for people, uh, especially to write experiments that compare against different types of hardware. So uh, we went to the FAST Usenix conference, and there people were very interested in, you know, we have dozens of uh, SSD models that people can compare against and uh, run benchmarks on. So, yeah, no, that's, that's, I'm impressed. Uh, yeah, well, we're glad you're excited. So, OK, I just refreshed my page here, and it says it's active. It took about 12 minutes. And that's, that's kind of the cascade, like, our take longer than the Skylake nodes. Um, so due to our Jupyter, you may see that a little pop up there that says you have to re-authenticate. Uh, but if you just click through, it should get you back to where you were. All right, and I see it finally printed out, done, and for waiting for server to start. So now it's done. All right, next step. Uh, is to connect it to a floating IP so that we can programmatically control it. So let me run this. Okay. And what this does is it attaches the floating IP and now it's trying to connect to port 22 uh, to check for SSH. And I expect this to work. Uh, while that's connecting, I'll check out the serial console again, which might be more interesting now that it's actually booted. Uh, yeah. Serial console is not as nice as SSH. Uh, it's very useful to have the uh, that working. Okay, it looks like it is still, it says it's active, but it is still booting up. Uh, 
Um, I guess I can show off other things. I have a logistics question. Sure. When you're requesting a project, um, I'm, I'm, you're going to get some kind of limits on what you request. But is it is it just like the number of things that you can request? It's not like uh, the type of resources. Uh, yes. So if I go to my projects here, uh, there's this allocation. And right now we have uh, 20,000 SU service units. Mm -hmm. And that basically is a, a CPU hour. Well, actually, it's mm -hmm. a node hour. Yeah. So if uh, that should be quite generous, uh, we, we typically find. You know, if I am doing single node experiments, I might not ever hit that limit um, because these are only for six months. You must renew. Um, if I'm using a GPU, those we, we do cost like two or four units per hour for those. Um, so, so they cost you more. Yeah. But um, if you have a good uh, research project, you can always come and ask us for either a reach, reach out, so more rotation, mm -hmm. or, or renew, which is for more than six months. This is like I said, some, some users have been renewing their options forever instead of asking for new ones. Mm -hmm. so I still keep working on this one research project that I started five years ago. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I'll say for the I don't think it's ever really an issue for users. You know, if they're using up all 20,000 units, you know, within a month and they keep asking us every month, we'll, we'll notice and we'll. It happens. Yeah. We keep tabs on this a little bit that helps us and helping us understand how the system is used. Yeah. yeah. But to your question, we don't place. Um, restrictions on what resources you can use. The only restriction is you can't create longer lease than, than seven days. Mm -hmm. If nobody creates a lease after you, right? So nobody makes a reservation when, when your reservation ends, uh, there's a way, programmatic way for you to renew your lease and you could be in principle renewing it indefinitely. If you if nobody wants that resource, mm -hmm. uh, the GPU resource is not going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> it's going to happen, right? Okay. Yeah, like, like here under the leases in the GUI, there's an update lease button, and I can ask it to prolong my lease. Um, so if, if I ask it for more than seven days, actually, I think if I ask it at all right now, it will tell me, you know, you still have a few days on this lease. Renew it when it gets closer to the end. Um, and, and this is just to help people play nice and share the resources we have. Yeah. But um, yeah, as long as people show us that they're doing, you know, good research, we want them to use our resources. You know, and, and you're mapping everything in the service unit, so there's no. Yes. For, you don't have to ever restrict. Oh, you can only use CPUs. You can only use this type of GPU. Uh, yes, we we don't really have the, uh, super fine grained. Uh, charges that we're doing for people. And it's mostly like when they create a lease, we add that to the tracker. And I, I can click view here because I think it should show me a table of like, yeah, how many things it says, right? I reserved a floating IP and a host and that charged us uh, a third of a service unit. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, back in the GUI, my serial console finally came up. It printed out some stuff, but I can say, who am I? And I'm in this node. So I think it finally should say that the connection is successful. So the thing I can do is I can copy the IP and uh, open the Jupyter terminal here. And I'll be able to SSH uh, CC, the cl Chameleon Cloud user. And it gets me into that node in this Jupyter environment. You know, I can do like LS CPU. And it should tell me, you know, I'm SSH'd into a pretty powerful CPU. Yeah, 96 threads. Um, and I, I could do this on my local, you know, any way I want to use SSH. But the way that we like to encourage people to use it is in the programmatic interface so that their work can be replayed. 
let me go on to the next step, which is configuring the instance. Um, so it talks about we just provisioned it, but you know we're, we're a, just a stock CentOS image. So let me run this next command, which is just running uh, an SSH connection to it. It uploads a setup old file, a setup bash script, um, which runs a package manager. And here, it looks like it's installing as we speak. And there's this note here uh, that instead of installing, I could have just took a snapshot of my disk and used that. So that's kind of a different way to think about it. Uh, there was the presentation on uh, the snapshotting VMs with old software. Uh, we and Kate mentioned we have thousands of old user snapshots of you know they installed everything they need, saved the disk, and then they can boot to it later. Um, or I can take this approach where I'm installing it as I need it, uh, and Jupyter helpfully outputs all the things the package manager did, and it says complete. So this next part is, you know, the experiment setup is done, and now I can actually run the experiment. Uh, and in this particular experiment, we're going to use stress ng uh, to load the CPU, and we're going to measure the power consumption of uh, the of, of this program. So there's, it says here, here's a script, run experiment, and we're going to run it with different parameters. I can open that before we upload it. And uh, it's basically just calling this stress ng. And there's this etrace2 tool that's installed that will give us the power uh, output. Let me run it. I think this is going to take uh, a little bit since we're running for 10 seconds. And this is running at various levels of stress, 25%, 50%, 100%. 100%. And then that'll finish very soon. And once it's done, uh, it tells me, you know, I put my data in this tarball. I can run the cell, which pro programmatically downloads that. Uh, and extracts it into the out directory in my Jupyter notebook. So let me open that. So seconds ago, there's a few runs. So I can open that and see exactly the data. Um, you know, this is just one way to do it. This is a pretty small amount of data for an experiment. Uh, 22 samples per uh, run. Those these. But uh, we could also use the object store or the NFS to share data if we had more. Um, OK. And this experiment tells us open up the analysis. I can do this. And Jupyter saves the previous analysis. So here is these graphs that Kate had in her presentation from the last time we ran this experiment. But uh, I can run it again. And this is just some Python code to uh, load that data into plots and see what happens. And if I look here, I see there's three lines, each for a different percent load on the CPU. Uh, and the y axis here is the power consumption. So we see, you know, with 25% CPU, use 250 watts. And if double, it used 310 watts ish. Um, and 100% about 350. So uh, uh, this is a fairly simple experiment, but uh, I can run whatever analysis I want on this data. So like the keynote showed uh, on Tuesday, I, I have access to the raw data. I have access to the same analysis the authors did. Uh, I can do whatever I wish to with uh, the code that they used to generate the graphs in the paper. I don't, are there, are there any questions about this or any thoughts so far? I have a question. So this is a, an experiment that generates data. Yes. 
what about input data? What about experiments that call on data from somewhere else? Is that, how, how would that work? Where would the data have to be? Sure, so um, one of the inputs that we're using here are like the experiments executable files. And what we do is we upload those to the community resources that we provisioned. So uh, that is one way to upload. I, I can you know, run any commands I want on that resource I provision and upload data. So for example, we have some machine learning ones. And this, this is an old one, so it's, it's private at the moment. Um, but I can launch it. And this one downloads data from uh, Kaggle, uh, a Stanford DOGS data set. Uh, it asks you to, since, since that's an external service, you know, this notebook says, you know, please give me an API key. And then it'll, it automates, you know, logging into the resource, installing Kaggle, downloading the data set, extracting it. Um, so there's there's a few answers to your question. Um, the, you know, the main answer is it depends on the experimenter where they want to have their data. Um, but and there are two possibilities. One is we have about roughly speaking five kilobytes of global store in Kamunda, and it's configured as object store and also as a, a shared file system. Um, and the fact that it is not a lot in this day and age, for computer science experiments, actually not too bad. Uh, because uh, you know, people experiment with less data. So certainly one way to, to do this is to download the data set to one of those places and you know, either share it or not share it or whatever. The other way that experimenters very often um, deal with this is a system called Globus, um, and it moves data. It's, it's very good for now. And um, we used to have, they actually used to have an image on Kimonium that they were making available to others. But again, I think it's more relevant with the main sciences than computer sciences. So I'm not sure if they are doing that anymore. But, but effectively, you could, put, you could deploy a, an image with Globus on it, and you could just pull the data uh, as part of your experimental workflow. Uh, from you know wherever you keep the data otherwise. Um, it's easy to set up those things because we can give you a public um, uh, IP before uh, addresses. Um, so you can, you know, whatever you can create a service on your instance and it's extra more addressable and uh, all sorts of things, right? So it's not like you're sitting like you're sitting behind some firewall and it all gets complicated, you can have a public IP address. Yeah, so to show that example I mentioned here is uh, the notebook a student made for us a few years ago, and they are just running uh, bash commands to download uh, the data set using Kaggle or whatever other tools you would need. So. We've also worked with people who use S3 and they you know, can invoke an S3 command to pull in data. Or uh, I can show uh, another example in a bit of their research Daniel presented yesterday, uh, which gets it from an edge device. So. I have a follow up question on the data thing. Sure. Um, I, I, I guess storage is cheap, but. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm also thinking about, it seems like the current state of uh, computer scientists machine, machine learning is probably drifting quickly <laughs> towards <laughs> large language models. And that's, you know, people are training huge amounts of data on huge amounts of data. Do you guys have any concept of like hosting data that the same, like on your object store that the same people could uh, like point to to use as their training? Is that? Well, so we had the from the beginning. So people were experimenting large data. You know, um, when, when we were building Camellia, the passion was to download uh, Wikipedia mm -hmm. and experiment on that. And this is this is why we ended up with like five kilobytes of storage. When we built the system, um, nobody wanted to actually do that, you know. Um, we would love to provide the system like that for, for sharing data. 
but I think it's more of a, it's kind of like the possibility, it's more of a community friendship, right? You know, the community has to organize behind that. And, mm -hmm. You know, whatever the current question is, whether it's Wikipedia or whatever other data set, we love to host it. Um, I'm reasonably sure that storage would not be a problem, not the same word in two, uh, in two uh, HTC data centers, uh, especially in tons of storage that mm -hmm. they could probably uh, repurpose or temporarily add to the volume for that purpose. So, uh, you know, if, if there is a need, if there is an issue like that, we can throw resources on it, but we can't organize the community. I mean, uh, we're trying to get the community behind it because it's super important across the board. Um, and we have a special project for that, right? As, as infrastructure providers, it's not something we can do. I see. I feel like it's a tricky question. Sorry. If you like, it's a tricky problem because yes. um, you know, there is in the data community and there is a kind of a trend toward uh, data visiting. So, so you're not downloading it, but you, you're bringing your compute to the data, mm -hmm. and that's important, especially with secure data. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, making that connection between the the analysis and the, the computing resources that you need and the data it, is evolving. It, it's I I don't think we live anymore in a world where where you download everything and you just do it in your own. Yeah, it's yeah. not possible. I, I completely um, agree with this. I think the the problem is much more visible in the main sciences, though, than in computer science. Computer science, the truth is, I mean, even you know, Torstein, he works on on large scale problems, but he's talking about a million data points. That's not that much data. <laughs> I mean, it depends on how big your data point is, right? But it's not a huge amount. Um, so in computer science, the you know, a vast majority of experiments, I would say, operate on relatively small data sets. Um, it would be interesting, it's super interesting to do what you say. And I definitely, I'd love to build infrastructure for that, right? But, but again, it's a, the community, it would have to be community driven, right? The community would have to say, all right, we've got some data sets that we'd like to have. Where can we put it? Uh, you know, I can find you a few petabytes. I uh, can definitely put, put it on a few petabytes. If you need more than that, I can find you more than that. After that, we're writing a proposal and we're saying we need this data oriented computer science test that, right? this, that, is, that is designed differently, but it's a bit of a chicken and egg problem, right? What should, what should come first? Well, we have, we have a little bit of a chicken, right? So, <laughs> yeah. you know, you just need to lay some eggs and then or, or you know you did mention globus and if this is something people need we'd love to work with someone like them who to, to integrate it more with and make it easier for researchers to yeah, yeah, yeah she was just pointing out we can't i mean we're, we're, we're increasingly limited in how much we want data right yeah. and, uh, the, the current data computation ratio favors moving computation, I would say. Yeah, you mentioned S3, like you have support for some S3 connections, because I think like Common Call, which is a big text data set, like terabytes and terabytes of data, mm -hmm. um, is hosted on S3. Okay. So we have um, a part of our, our storage in Chromium is called uh, is Swift, mm -hmm. it's object storage, it's very similar to S3. Uh, but we also have uh, this one Jupyter notebook from Trovi from uh, a collaborator from Renzi, who uh, was running experiments over Camellion and commercial clouds. And there's this NSF funded project called Cloudborn, which will be for the abuse of commercial clouds. So, uh, and you know, of course, download is one of those things you have to pay for, right? Um, so, um, Probably, if you took his notebook, uh, you could adapt it, or you could, you know, see specifically how to run the commercial cloud in Kimonian's data set, and then the cloud bank project. I don't suggest that you pay for all of this yourself, yeah. especially if we're talking about actually the sense. Yeah, yeah. You know. 
I, I do not want to train a large language model, just yeah. to be clear. <laughs> but I am curious about how yeah. the platform. Uh, <laughs> yeah, maybe it would be good to point out on our page there's about and papers. And uh, this one down here, Overcast, I believe, is what yeah, you're yeah. referring to. Mm -hmm. um, so that Jupyter notebook is just a reproducible Overcast. Okay. And then uh, I'd also like to point out the Used in Research tab, which shows all the things people have done on Chameleon. And this is the 600, uh, uh, how many of, uh, citations? 613 papers. Okay. Yeah, so. Well, last count, but that was like two months ago. <laughs> yeah, there, there's a lot here that, uh, you know, we're happy to show off, so. Um, so, so I just yeah. understand, so those papers there, you can reproduce in, in Chameleon, more or less. Uh, or have they used chameleon? They, used, they, used they, chameleon. they mentioned that they used us. Yeah, okay. they don't include our papers. Yeah. Our papers are under a different tab. Yeah. Um, there's something else. There are papers about the system that uh, we have done in our group, right? These are papers from our users who, who for the most part, you know, we don't know the personal. Okay, way. I see. <laughs> this is a, a thing we would like to do, though, is some of these were involved in reproducibility initiatives at the conferences they were submitted at. And, and they very well likely did not use uh, Trovi yet. Uh, and so they lived elsewhere, but we would like to, you know, highlight which, which of these have that. Maybe create another page of, you know, reproducible papers on Chameleon or something like that, but that's... Um, so maybe I can talk just a bit more about the other things we have on to show off what else is on Trovi at the moment. I mentioned we work with some storage researchers at FAST, um, and they have created this, oops, let me go back, uh, this simple benchmark file system, and like the power management one, this is what we like to call an experiment pattern in that it isn't reproducing the results of the paper at the moment, but we hope that it can lead you into something you can copy and paste to run your experiment or similar. So uh, I was talking to them and they shared, you know, here at this paper, at this conference, they just need something to run uh, these standard benchmarks. And they talk about there's this commodity tool, FIO, uh, which uh, exercises storage IO in various ways. So this group has uh, created this experiment that you can, like what we just did with the power management, you click play and it hopefully works without errors. Uh, you don't have to really interact with it. Uh, let me see. Yeah, I think it is here. But if I go to the analysis, uh, we can see they've collected some sample data from these commodity benchmark tools uh, under a uh, Linux file system. And if I'm a storage researcher, maybe I want to take this. I can use the same exact experiment setup in the experiment workflow, uh, but maybe I need to add a step to use my novel file system or, or something and compare the results. Uh, so these experiment patterns are a starting point. They're things you can copy and paste, fill in the details, uh, and turn it into uh, a work. And the next one I would like to show off in this main is the one Daniel presented on yesterday, the multi-experiment edge to cloud workflow. Um, AOPS was the name. And he mentions here this is based on uh, an edge to cloud experiment pattern. And he has extended this to make it work with other test beds, showing that you can uh, run the same work on these various environments, not just Chameleon. And I'll just open it up and show off. He has some nice pictures, I think, under here. Uh, the vision is we have these edge devices, and they submit data to the cloud over some broker. And on that cloud, we can process and uh, see what results we get. And this is where our Chiat Edge platform comes in. 
So he reserves Raspberry Pis, and instead of actually having these in the savanna, taking photos of animals, uh, it downloads a data set and just sends that. But you, you can imagine uh, getting that data from a camera rather than uh, this pre existing data set. And then he also shows it on uh, FID IoT Lab and Grid 5000. Um, and then maybe I can mention, so, so this is uh, an experiment that you can reproduce now with, there's a link here. The other way to get to these is on uh, the experiment Trovi page, uh, you can just search. So I can search for that multi-platform edge to cloud experiments. And we're also tagging these. So people have assigned reproducible research to their artifacts that are trying to reproduce something. And there, uh, Daniel's experiment comes up as the first one. Um, and I'd like to point out one more at the moment, uh, this reproducing Tacotron 2 qualitative claims. Uh, so this was made by one of Freda Fund's students, Priyanka uh, and Chandra. They uh, are very familiar with the CoLab uh, environment, which I don't know if people here use at all, but it's uh, Google's uh, way to package their notebooks. And they have the advantage of being Google, they're very large, and so people use that, and uh, especially machine learning people like to, you know, uh, share a notebook easily with that. And in their environment, you can run it. Uh, provided you have access to the GPU requirements that this uh, these notebooks require. So if I launch it, and I think I launched it ahead of time. Is it timed out? Let me relaunch it. Uh, their notebook here has a citation. Uh, and what they're interested in is running this uh, researcher's uh, machine learning model and comparing what the output is to what they say it is. So this may take a second, but uh, I wanted to point out that this is a little different than what we saw earlier, where I'm using Jupyter to orchestrate the resources in a chameleon server. Uh, now I'm using Jupyter to orchestrate the resources in the chameleon server in order to run a collab runtime. And this is something, uh, it's a like service you can connect to from your collab notebook uh, to add resources to it. So collab, you can either use like Google Cloud as a backend, uh, or with this method, you can use uh, chameleon resources as a backend, rather than if you don't have, you know, Google credit that you get through your institution or something. So yeah, trying to switch to the tab, but Zoom is uh, blocking me. Yeah. Is Colab's a, a runtime? So is it a full container or? Uh, so Co Colab is, yeah, actually, and let me download this because I can look at myself and just ask how I was with it. So uh, let me actually open it because I think I didn't scale up our Jupyter Hub in anticipation of this, of me launching a bunch. So it's slow right now, but this is the notebook I believe that they're using. Uh, uh, yes. And it does have a web environment here. But when I want to go run it, it'll ask me to connect to something. Okay. And I, I can either have it run on my laptop, but it's going to be really hot, use all my battery, and I don't really have a great GPU here. So it's going to be slow. I can get, connect it to a Google Cloud. VM, uh, or I can do a hosted runtime. And here uh, it'll ask me, I think, to input a URL. Or, it's a or, or, or actually, for around a notebook. Yeah, so actually, it is this local runtime backend. So oh. it, it's installing the server on Chameleon's resources so I can run this notebook uh, on these powerful nodes. Nice. Okay. And what I'd, I'd like to you know, point out that that is a really cool way to use things people have already done. And I was kind of going to end this part by 
saying we have all of these various experiment patterns that show off different parts of chameleon. And I would be happy to show more. We have some of these interesting things to reproduce. Uh, and these can all be great ways to get started uh, packaging the experiment in chameleon. But in terms of, you know, I want to create an experiment, maybe I don't have one of my own. What can I do? Uh, people were talking about papers with code. Uh, you know, you, you can take these things people have shared and make it so they run with one click on chameleon. Um, or this idea of connecting a collab runtime. I can search GitHub for Google Colab <laughs> repositories uh, and find interesting experiments that people have already written in Jupyter notebooks and launch these. Um, so yes, yes, I, yes I, I think now maybe we can take a break. Uh, yeah. So maybe 11, um, and really the rest of the uh, uh, session, what we want to suggest is that you, uh, we've got this reproducible research in Provi, if you want to pick up an experiment and try to reproduce it um, and tell us what works and what doesn't work, what's hard, what's not hard, what, you know, what we should improve, that would be fantastic, but also, you know, just see if this vision of picking up an experiment from a hub and playing with it, if that works for you. Um, the other possibility is package your own experiment, right? So we're here, we can help, uh, you know, either methodology suggestions or how to use chameleon or anything like that. Um, I know about those experiment patterns, they're uh, not so much about different features of chameleon, but they are designed to be so if you can think of experiment as you set up an experimental environment, so you allocate resources, configure them, and so on. The second stage being you actually run an experiment. So everything is set up for your experiment. You just run your benchmark or whatever it is you're running. The third stage is data analysis. These experiment patterns represent that first stage. You set up an experiment that does in, in a specific area. Right, so uh, you can you can treat them as maybe half of an experiment already there, and most of them also have those benchmarks in it. So this FIO benchmark, so not just set up sets up the storage experiment for you, but also runs the benchmark and does some data analysis. It's not necessarily connected to a specific paper because it's been developed to uh, be kind of a cut and paste experiment pattern to help people get started. Um, writing their experiments or, you know, different ones. So uh, I would say, yeah, uh, maybe a little break, uh, five minutes, come back, you know, it's free form. We'll, we'll hear about that you can offer these experiments and don't pack you.
is a this is a byproduct of those this is a person I'm exploring by by doing the study by some out there as well. So oh yeah, they are they're in the so that's the exciting part. Is that a remarkable tablet? Yeah. Do you like it? I do. I, I even got the new the new keyboard because of how much it's been kind of transformative. The, I, I got it as a gift from a friend because mm -hmm. he didn't like it. Mm -hmm. So I started out a leg up, like having he didn't buy into it, so I didn't have like too much invested, but yeah. I got the I guess this is a different path in my brain. And part of this is because I mean, a lot of us came out, a lot of people came up with using keyboards to do stuff but it was i was in journalism and creative writing and so in high school i was doing journalism and I, in, in the 80s i'm doing desktop publishing and stuff you literally were printing and clicking pasting onto paper to oh, no. the printer stuff but i was always very much in the realm of i'm, I'm an editor and a writer and so when i get on the keyboard I, I, the flow is very different mm. which is actually well, my it's an interesting aspect of my you know it's a practice for me in open source to always be trying to pull writing out as quick as possible and not to be spending time trying to perfect it but this seems to come at this goes back to an age you know my brain there are pathways before i was on the keyboard and so it, so as a writing pathway for writing your for writing all kinds of things you know, it's, it's, it's turned out to be really fantastic and then to be able to to, to sketch for an idea based on a conversation and then send it to you and then we can talk it back and forth until it's correct and then have that converted into it. Then it's really up there. Because if I start trying to do a graphic from our conversation on a program on here, yeah. then I will be down by the pixels moving things around and never get the big picture done. Like there's this weird thing about it. Like this lets me do the big picture. But now the keyboard is the new this reactor with that. So oh, and, oh. Cool. And it's uh, pretty, pre you know, it's it's not even, it doesn't, I don't know, it doesn't need charging, it doesn't need anything else. It's part of the folio. And the um, the dynamic is, I mean, it gives you a, a, a place you can put type text directly into, into if I was to start. Yeah. And, and it's really, you know, and they've got fonts, you know, it's got a different way, and just a, and it's just very basic course, and so there's no web browser or anything else. So mm -hmm. I carry this with me in my life thing and I sit down at a cafe and I'm not or in a park or something and I'm not being distracted with these other things. I mean, I just there's been a I'm still learning how to use it. I think I'll use it. control key down this special thing, right? Two, three, four, five. Yeah, so this isn't this is basically all the possible things you can do editing wise. But the standard pieces are there in terms of control shift and arrows to select and move and copy and paste text and to move around within the document. So all of that memory is built in, you know, undo and redo. Um, and uh, yeah, and then some other you know, yeah, control W and then search. Right. And so then you can mix within a doc, a single document. Right. And so it's kind of, and then you can see that they're sort of trying to build up to this sort of thing for a while. Yeah. Of, uh, that's how the whole thing and comes together. And there's, and it's, they've got a cloud service that then back up into, and I don't know if I, I may actually be. Oh, that's back down. That's not what I'm going to do. Highly secure, so it's going to go ahead. 
Maybe um, I could also introduce just quickly. Uh, so, so people are are, for, would, are free to explore any of this. We'd love to uh, talk about it. If anyone has any questions, uh, how these things actually like get packaged and made. So there are a few options here. Um, so if I, uh, from the main Chameleon website, there's an internet computer interface, and that brings you to our hub, and hopefully that's great. And here is uh, kind of, it's kind of like a VM. You know, I have my own little environment with a file system. I can get a terminal, I can install libraries or whatever software I want. Um, I can create these directories, and uh, we have an interface to package these uh, artifacts. So I have this directory here called AlexNet with some, I, I was taking that work a student did, I, I mentioned earlier, and trying to update it because it's been a few years. Um, so if I want to actually, I haven't 100% finished it, uh, but for the sake of example, I can show how it works. So I can click, I can right click it and do package as artifact. Um, and we have some idea, uh, guidelines sort of of what should happen or what you know this ideally should be. We have a link to our documentation, which explains everything in more details and tells you everything you can do. Um, but it'll ask you for some metadata. So I'll say, this is my AlexNet demo. A short description. This it's a demo artifact. Um, it's still a work in progress, but uh, that's okay. I can give it a bit of a longer description. Uh, this artifact reproduces, and then you know, explain in detail what people might be, why they should be interested in this. Uh, I can make it private or public. I'll just leave it private for now, just to not confuse anyone who's looking at it, maybe since it doesn't exactly work fully. Uh, I can add authors here. I'll just add myself as the only one. And then I can upload. Uh, it basically just zips uh, the files I have, uploads them, and then it says it was successfully packaged. Uh, I can click that link there, and it'll take me to my artifact. Uh, there are a few more options here. I can, since I'm the owner, I have this share button and there's some more options. I can publish it to Zenodo to get a DOI. Uh, there's a private link that, uh, since this artifact is private, I can share this link with people to see it. And then this third section here is uh, enabling day pass. So to do that, we it's called reproducibility requests here. And Kate was talking about it, but the idea is somebody who has never used Chameleon before. So let me go back here to the bare metal experiment pattern. Somebody who's never used Chameleon before, they won't see this launch button because we haven't given them an allocation, but they may be interested in still running your experiment. So instead you can enable this request day pass button and It'll ask them to enter some details and you know leave a comment so it doesn't seem like it's spam. Uh, and this will go to the author of that artifact is, and actually I think it goes to their PI. So the author may be a PI or the author can delegate someone else to receive these emails or, or the PI can delegate someone else if they're busy, but uh, we're trying to preserve some chain of uh, responsibility and they'll see that request they can click approve and in this case i'm the requester i would get an email back saying you were approved for a day pass click this link to 
join a chameleon allocation for X number of hours. Uh, so that is the day pass idea. And the, the day pass does not count against there. Uh, yes, it, it's a, its own separate allocation. So so this project, if I enable day pass for it, th this artifact, uh, it'll give me a 1,000 SU allocation. Just making sure people don't mine a ton of Bitcoin in a few hours. Yeah. And uh, uh, yeah, it, it, it'll be separate. And we. We're hoping people use this more. So if we have to impose more limits, maybe we will in the future. But for now, we just want to encourage. Yeah. So the day pass is, is a pilot at this point. Mm -hmm. And you know, which means that we don't really understand what the pitfalls are. Generally speaking, Moonian is organized by delegating responsibility. So when you get a project and it will not SPI, you're responsible for the good behavior of the people on your project, right? Mm -hmm. um, so you're responsible for making sure that nobody likes Bitcoin, right? Um, or allow, you know, configures their instances in such a way that the configuration results in somebody getting hacked and somebody might not be coming, right? So th this one is another example of that as a as the owner of the day pass location, you give out access to people who you feel are more or less legit, right? If we find somebody who asks for day pass location and somehow everybody who uh, uh, tries to reproduce their experiment ends up mining Bitcoin, I'd say that would raise a few like those. <laughs> yeah, and, and one thing you know that might help is if, if you're a student or maybe you mentioned, you know, I saw your presentation at ACM Rep, you know, and I want to, or I saw your paper. Uh, just we're trying to also foster the community there, you know. Um, there's also this edit artifact screen, which kind of does as you would expect. You can update your metadata, uh, add other people who are able to collaborate on this artifact and upload new versions. Uh, back in my Jupyter environments. Yes, yeah, so I have a question again. Okay. Um, if you're updating when when you have a DOI, it's associated with the artifact. Yes. Um, but not the metadata. So if I go and update the metadata, it's not going to change the DOI. Are, are you doing like versioning on? Uh, we we do versioning on the artifact contents, not the description and title, I believe. Um, so yeah, if if I now go back to my Jupyter and. There, there's a way to edit it. Actually, there should be a way to create a new artifact version. I think it's, let me close that. I mean, so, so you said it's integrated with Zenodo, right? Uh, yes. yes. So you, you can, now that I have an artifact version, I actually think if I go under share, it will let me request a DOI but from, so it, it, for it this specific version that I just uploaded. Oh, so yeah. the, the Jupyter notebook files that I upload. So it'll use Zenodo's DOI thing where each, it, there's like a DOI for the entire artifact, and then there's a DOI for each version of the artifact. Uh, yes, uh, I think it's, these files are archived mm -hmm. into a zip, and, and that's what's uploaded to Zenodo. Mm -hmm. so this is actually, this, this hints at a, a very interesting problem that we had in, um, I co founded a, a journal on software mm -hmm. um, called Software X. And it was always the kind of uh, question also, if if somebody published software, did they make a new version? Is that a new publication, right? Mm -hmm. And the solution, that, which is essentially a very similar question to what you asked me, right? And, and, and the answer to your question was, well, it depends, right? If it's a if it's a minor version, it's a minor improvement to the software, it doesn't constitute any result, uh, right? Then they should just create a new version of the software and just keep creating new versions of the software. If they have a new major, um, you could say major feature that represents a new result, a significant new functionality of the software that expands it as a, as a scientific instrument to support mm -hmm. something completely different, then it counts as um, a, a, a new result, right? And it, it could be could be published again. And, and in the same vein here, um, if, if your experiment changes, so let's say you have the same experimental pattern, 
but you running now a completely new experiment. Um, uh, you know, chat GPT 2 versus chat GPT 4, significant mm -hmm. difference, I would say, right? So yeah. I, I would say those are two different results, right? But, but yet the same mode in a sense. Mm -hmm. I see, okay. Um, yeah, I can mention there's also, now that I've created this artifact, there's a create a new artifact version button. And if I upload, uh, it'll show up with a new uh, version on the side there. So let me go back to the main page and I can see that historic uh, version. Okay, yeah. And then I, I can also point out uh, just a few more things. We also, some people, don't necessarily prefer to work in this interface and they keep their notebooks in a git repository for example so one thing i can do is i can take that git link and i think if i do edit uh, i can create new versions directly from git uh, there's also you, you you can originate the artifact from git as well there's another button but i can add that git url and then if i tagged my commits that'll let me pick which one you know version 1.0 and uh, clone it from git in the future um, and then I think the last thing I want to mention is we also track metrics uh, in trophy so here there's this bare metal experiment pattern and it says there's 285 people that clicked the launch button and launched this um, and recently so these metrics these next ones look a little smaller, but these are more recent. We're tracking individual number of people who have clicked that. And we're also tracking people who've executed cells in this notebook. And so I think there is some potential to uh, analyze Jupyter usage a bit more here. But for now, we can uh, help measure the impact of these artifacts better. Um, and I think that is basically all the features Kate introduced earlier. Um, so if, again, there's these slides with interesting things to explore, or if people may have interesting ideas of their own or, uh, experiments, uh, we'd love to help talk to you and make it possible, or, or we'd love also any feedback uh, on these tools. When you've done, like, I'm okay. running the experimental experiment pattern okay. thing, ah. is there a way to say, you know, I know for sure I'm done, I'm going to release these resources? <laughs> yes, I, I did notice that we should create a new version because that one does not have a delete cell at the end. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. Uh, so the fact that you have to lease your resources, when your lease ends, it is automatically cleaned up. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, a good practice is, you know, set that for a few hours. If you, the spare metal experiment pattern, you can run in half an hour, including the setup time. Mm -hmm. So that lease could only be half an hour to, uh, or to be generous, it can be two or three hours. Um, and that should minimize uh, impact on other people who want those resources. But uh, yes, we, we do also have this Python interface with ways to delete your lease. Uh, just to be explicit about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, and most of our other experiment patterns, we try to include that step explicitly. One, one note that uh, Mark and I will have to leave at 11.45 a couple of minutes before then to run to the airport. So hey, we're well, going to be here for another 20 minutes. <laughs> yeah, and may, maybe on that, if you want to get in contact with us, we mm -hmm. have, uh, if you're logged in, there's this help desk button. And this is like what our users report as the number one feature. And it goes directly to us. Uh, even Kate sees all of these tickets every week. Uh, we review them and discuss what problems people are having and what we can do as we're planning more features and improvements to the test bed, uh, what people want. 
Feature experiments users have run on our resources, um, and if people you know have interesting tools that they're working with and that can potentially help other people, we'd love to show that off. So this is our most recent one, uh, talking about how a student uh, Jacob uh, packaged or how he created this tool to really improve uh, file transfers. Um, so you know, communicate about changes we're making to the test bed every month uh, and tips and tricks on, you know, how uh, you can use the, uh, all of the services we have. So, you know, we talked about we have all these sites. Maybe it's interesting to, you to make sure your experiment can run at any chameleon sites. So we're, we're very federated in, in the sense that uh, we're, we're not, I think AWS is similar where some things don't automatically transfer between sites. Chameleon, uh, you, you can do it, uh, and this is how, so. So that might be, I might better, you know, I've got a topic that I'm curious about that's, that's a little bit, Sure. Anyway, but it's back to what I was talking with you about at lunch. I think it was lunch yesterday. Okay. Yeah. So, um, and so I think kind of I'll recap for for Kate and the rest of the room. But um, just curious about about you know we're we're starting to get to being service providers for research, right? And I have a relationship with a completely different research cloud that's doing similar and different things, mm -hmm. right? And, and which is not uncommon in the research space. I mean, that's part of you know spawning yeah. things is great. But but there's also this dynamic that we're getting into where. The, the cost of the underlying cloud platform becomes this limitation that everybody's running into. Like we were, we're you were telling me a story yesterday about, about power outage dynamics. And, and I was telling the story of a Ron Krieger told me that that it, at, in the, the mass open cloud, they actually turn off, they have a power, um, a planned power outage in August of every year of four days where they do systems work. And he told me it's because he wanted to, the researchers to not think of this environment as a 24 seven, 365, because it was so reliable that people were starting to treat it like it was a free AWS environment that would just keep going. And so there's these really interesting dynamics that all of us are running across at, at these levels. And then then there's a point of where the chameleon sites kind of thing is trying to address of, or I would presume that you know, how are you going to scale beyond just the resources that are accessible via the organizations you have relationships with now? How do you, what are the, the, uh, there's, 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 there's connecting at the funding level and there's also connecting at the technical and the, the open, the open collaborations, the open source doer levels. And we're, and uh, right now we have those capabilities. We could be, I mean, that, that was my first thought here was like, oh, I can be using and taking advantage of the day pass to get some of my friends over at Mass Open Cloud to come over and take a look and see what you're doing and try some things back and forth, maybe, and not just people who were like the lead data scientists or things like that, folks who really would be curious to see how mm -hmm. things are coming. But the other thought that I'm wondering about is, is you know, is this that is are we getting? Is there starting to be a critical mass? And is this and this is in, especially in anticipation of what the federal funding might be towards an, a nationwide effort. And if there's something national that's going to be coming or that's going to be happening, and there's some indications that maybe there is, right? Then, mm -hmm. then having us begin to get together on the grassroots level and start to have those those grass tips conversations between all the PIs and everyone in the different. Um, well, I mean, you've, yeah, yeah. So you know, we're, that, um, that's what I'm curious about. It's like, you know, is this the time for the starting of of that? And um, uh, and is there you know, is there energy for that? And what's the what's the what maybe what's the venue or what's the dynamic to do? Yeah. Well, I think that this is something that uh, to, to a large extent has been going on for a while, right? Where, uh, so we're talking about, so first of all, people are talking about the national right? Yes, okay. Uh, so I think this is going to be a cloud, I think it's part of the time zone. Yes, right. Uh, 
to, to get up there when you yeah we're in the same supercomputing people the crowd looks very different for example than to me right i guess okay. for them it's just this is the next one is where i would expect ah, okay. so um i think that crowds like like Kimono, um because there's a spectrum it feels like Kimono, there's the, of course the cloud web project there's fabric which I would argue is a cloud as well, in, in the sense that it's got programmable interfaces, right? So, it's sort of a cloud, um, you know, there are more esoteric uh, uh, clouds, because there are more, um, there's actually a surprising number of clouds, so more based on clouds that just can do. The every institution seems to have clouds, but it's like that, right? So, that's it. It's quite interesting to uh, use access, and then you know, and then you go progressively exactly. towards sort of more streamlined and more so kind of the so most basic. So when you say a lot of people. Yeah, we'll do, we'll That's a, and I have, I did have an expansive viewpoint of, 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 of it in terms of it being you know, what I'm willing to use the con cloud in the conversation for somebody to, you know, uh, well, let me, let me go back from this. I, I mean, I'm thinking about research clouds in particular that would be underlying infrastructure, providing infrastructure as a service. Um, open infrastructure is my, is where my background and practice would be. So open in the sense of open source, open design, like everything but the secrets are Google. And so, uh, so even being able to get the, the telemetry down to the bare metal, and, and not just like you can just put a tap into and get the pull it out you want to, there's going to obviously the, the organization around tries to do some work to make sure that the privacy is taken care of, anonymity is happening, certain things are happening, but then be able to provide that sort of data. Um, yeah, because ultimately, I think that um, and maybe it's just because it's my background in platforms, but I just think of this as like on the bottom line, there's going to there's there's always going to be metal, there's always going to be an operating system, there's always going to be a thing that's running applications and something orchestrating that, and it could happen in layers. So even like the the high performance computing, I'm sure there are still plenty of ones where people are orchestrating their own. They've got their own custom code, but the future, what's the future that's going to be? And the the and. And, and I guess it depends on your performance character. Anyway, I don't want to get too far down that. I, I think there's a lot of good rabbit holes in there um, that are interesting. But I do wonder when what I'm. I guess what I'm thinking about is must be at the layer that's probably at the service and orchestration layer. Something that I mean, I can almost imagine something that's sort of lightweight. That could that is a, the what's the lightest way to connect different cloud resources to each other so we can be sharing. We can be bursting to each other or we can be connected together in a way in like a national emergency that you want to pull together all of these computing resources for doing vaccine research and and whatever well you know yeah, that has been a lot of people can do that to science and it's great uh and in different means in typical cases that they don't but it's more than we don't see in a Unless you can, right? so for example, um, energy, uh, energy based scheduling, and management, you know, mm, but you can use that. Um, you know, my energy costs uh, have yeah, tripled. And this is what we're talking about. Or the fact that and carrots, yeah, between the two. And if you understand that equation, if you understand the costs of running a large data center, you might be able to convince people it's like, well, now if we do this, um, we assign the link and the thing, it might actually be a good thing. And there is a way to do it. There are actually no So I think. Allocate the resources. I would say the time is uh, great. Your node, yeah, you have to make a difference. Yeah, but once once you have you know, connection to the resources, 
I would expect it. Yes. Um, so for the trend, the, the ninety-nine percent. Yeah, so yes. I think we have some scale, things that work out. Multi cloud artifact would do this, or we have another one. Bring that work in. Favorite. This now person works with fabric. So if you can you know, capture. Has, when you go to set up, you can either set it up on chameleon or fabric, and you know, you're running the same uh, thing, but uh, yeah, the interface at the start to so provision your resources. And I think it's I think the, the New England Research Cloud and the and, and its its production for researchers and students in, in New England, right? At that level. So they I mean they consider themselves a research cloud and, and not are not providing a service level agreement and are not acting in for, in any of that kind of mode. But it's it's um um I'm curious about the well, okay. Yeah, don't that makes a lot of sense what you're saying because it I mean it really has really well, this has to do with the layers and who and which um, yeah yeah I, I do think we should have very high bandwidth connections especially on because i think i'm, I'm realizing uh, there's a there's another layer in which we're all we're all getting together around around the open source tooling and that's yeah, another which is yeah. a middle place that yeah, right. that as that we, as we standardize on things like jupyter notebooks and using yeah. you know and if, and and when and when if we're careful about services that we use so we're not we're there's a github or a collab or anything like that what would you know but i think you've never been using us are replaceable so that we're not caught out or caught out of this if and when this go away i would expect to become the tool to be able to do similar with our object store i'm not aware of the number we have the various networking adapters, and I'm sure that it might be buried in our blog of like, uh, how fast people are transferring. Yeah. 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 So I just yeah. want to show you yeah. this. Uh, that is what okay. yeah. you know. Okay. So okay. Is, there you have your media the next iteration after mass open cloud and new england research out i dash scale so did you have to just like one step for this computer ron krieger and, and peter designers okay so 
<laughs> so the cortex R is one of these that H sub D sort of by a wolf mark. In in Iran that started the uh, the MOC alliance, mm -hmm. which was not which was used to be called Massive yeah, Cloud, yeah. And, uh, yeah. and so it's all that other things. Uh, so, so, yeah. Yeah. So, so, How much money is this? this, this conversation. Um, and I share all that's a good question because they haven't. I think that they were just doing, they were just putting or worker mm. in Camellia. So you can access that. So then you can how much are they how much are they asking for? How much are they getting? No, Who are they how, how much did they get for the census? Okay. Well, that's a good question. I don't know all the details. That is what it well, because I and that is what it and there is a open source um, I think that they both. I, I I think that they were they were they were working on a new word just actually um so. Uh, yeah, in, this would be, was it in June? Look, it, it so, kind of for the next level of funding. So I'm not mm -hmm. sure if this was funding that they gave. That's a board number. If they don't have access to it. Yeah, exactly. Uh, we, uh, since it's probably being funded by, out of the MOC Alliance right now, and they seem to get they seem to get more funding just for it. Yeah, I think it's what. And that's been. I mean, that's been. It's been. That's been how they, that's been part of how they yeah. how they grew the mass open cloud because one of the I mean even that right there mass it was a Massachusetts association that there's the Commonwealth of Massachusetts is like very directly involved in helping things that are running out of the the, the mass Massachusetts green high performance communication center and and so it has this whole cross connection but they they they. Uh, this, uh, the Commonwealth is interested in yeah, connecting with everybody broader, you know, yeah, but, they're, and they're, but they're, they're doing it in a long yeah, term and stuff, policy yeah. to test well, angle and stuff in there. And they're, I think they're also hoping yeah, that by all of the all of this grassroots yeah, things happening right. in the open space that we will all be making yeah, yeah. kinds of groups so, under one and, yeah, so, and, yeah. and uh, yeah, 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 you know, research group to research group connections and then the clouds to clouds and all this will happen. So, you know, are they really that um, right? Well, I guess I just know that um, I was fortunate to be at you can run it. Yeah, I was fortunate to get to, to I got to go to the uh, one of the last things I did at Red Hat actually was live the workshop where this was all announced. Um, I was where I'm the where, um, the, the, um, the MOC Alliance representative for a project that I don't know if Red Hat's funding anymore because I'm not there when they want it. And it's this whole you know, the, it's the whole dynamic of the world of it's it's fun when moving around and open, you know, open source is interesting because like your almost like your research can be you know you take the you take also like certain amount of the work with you where you go and the reputation and the stuff you sometimes keep doing the same work for somebody else and so i never know what this is going to turn out to be because it's but I appreciate going through this is this was great to look at. I've been and I got to and part of that shop was good to see to sit down with their facilitators whose job it is to work with the researchers and bring them up either in open space. So there's another test um help them containerize their things or help them you know get the programs going and and then support them as they're going forth and um, and and really how they're gonna how they're doing that on a social kind of the the culture change angle, as well as the very practical hands on how it's all going on. Um, so so I, I, I have some folks I'll be just, like I said, and, and, and not uh, just, to, you know, just to talk in the show too, because I think that's interesting to see how the that, that, that's the same thing. Yeah. 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 The same stack. Yeah. Oh, yes, exactly. Yes. Yeah. 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 The OCT yeah. is was yeah, that's part of that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no one has the aura. Uh, uh, yeah. There will be some. Oh. Yeah. So the architecture is the same. We will discuss the Really? Wow. Yeah, let me take a look because I, 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 uh, I have a coworker who has worked with them closely. So I think that's the other groups doing that. Uh, to, to use our hackers. 
and I, I can forward that. They do. They put yeah. They put all the FPGA, and I think they're running it through the. I think they're running it through the new industry. They they. they, they they put a lot, had to put a lot of effort into getting uh, front uh, setting going for the so that now that's the got all the single sign on all for the environment everyone that but that was like a years where the time of integrating that into open stack and open and, and I think that's probably what happened with, with the open cloud test bed was that focus so but yes I will I, I that's one actually I can follow up on because I just met those folks and I can yeah, yeah I will for certain yeah, something's going on. Okay, cool. Oh, so just send all these things here. Yeah, just see, your time is up, and I'm and I will uh, put anybody in contact with Mark. Sure. Yeah. I just thought about this. Well, it was a pleasure meeting you. Thank you for coming out. Yeah. yeah. We, we, we certainly send you stuff. I'll, I'll look you all up next time. I'm sure uh, come out and uh, see yeah. things. And then, because I don't like, oh, man, I can ship your hardware. Sure. Well, however, another option is, is yeah, yeah. Send, sending you our software. Yeah. And so, yeah. And uh, happy. Yes, but so ideally, it'd be in the, in the university where so like we could sure we could get yeah. some access to this and then run you know your applications on it and mm -hmm. such. Um, yeah. But so I can't commit to it right now. But I think this would be really cool. Thing. Yeah. If, if you send it to us, we would be happy to talk about it. Yes. Okay. Right. Yeah. yeah. Thanks so much for the presentation. <laughs> Right for everybody online. Um, unfortunately, Mark and I have to uh, leave. Yeah, I think it's. I think a couple of the people, two of those people are in the room. I think only one person's not in the room. Yeah. There were more people in earlier. Yes, we had like eleven. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's journey. Bye. 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 Ready about 15 minutes, we
Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Thank you.
Just you know, whenever you're ready for going down to the lunch, we're still setting up, okay. but it is. Of course. So you go down to the second floor, yeah. turn the elevator down, or walk down. It's like on the outside, just at the end of the building. Okay. That just so you can walk along the okay. that way, you'll see. Yeah, I'm just wrapping up an email to, oh, to Kate and Mark. Yeah. yeah, no, right. I'm literally. Did you say it was outside? Yes, it's outside. Oh, yeah. oh wonderful. And is this still on? Oh, you know, I got to change. All right, whoever is on, if anybody's still online, we're actually using a different Zoom room. Uh, I'm, I'm Casper. So, oh, you're Casper. Yeah, so I'm, I'll log off. I should have known that, sorry. Oh, no, no worries. I'm just ending it, so. Uh,